We're going to dive right into um, our final of a five-part sermon series called Back to the Basics. Have you enjoyed Back to the Basics? Just kind of digging into some big ideas that are just basic and fundamental. Today, I'm excited um, to, to dive into the last part, and then from here, we'll kind of launch into the big announcement. Uh, back to the Basics. <clears throat> Mark Twain said this, most of the time, we don't need <clears throat> new information. We just need to be reminded of what we already no, and that's the, the essence and the premise of the sermon series. Um, let me take you to Second Kings chapter 5. Let me take you to Second Kings chapter 5. I'm going to do my best to, to shorten this a little bit today. Um, I know that as you guys were looking for parking, uh, one group, that you, don't be angry at them. I, I went long today, <clears throat> so I'm going to do my best. Uh, Jesus mentioned a guy. Uh, his name was Naaman. How many ever heard of Naaman from the Old Testament? If you haven't, you're going to learn about him today, but it's interesting because there's a story about this guy who's not even an Israelite, okay? He's a commander, he has prowess and influence, and he's a powerful man, but he, he comes to Israel looking for a miracle. And Jesus mentions this when he goes to Nazareth because they rejected him in Nazareth, and he talks about, hey, in the days of Elisha, there were many lepers, and Jesus was ministering and healing lepers, and he said this, he said, there were many lepers, and not one of them were healed, save Naaman. Jesus actually mentions Naaman in his sermon. And so this obscure fellow in this obscure passage in 2 Kings chapter 5, I think it's important for us to just look at this man that Jesus had the wherewithal to remind us to think about when it comes to those who do and do not get their miracle. Those who can and cannot receive what God has for them. So 2 Kings chapter 5 and 1, I'm going to try to read as quick as possible. The king of Aram had great, uh, had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. At this time, Aramian raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. One day, the girl, was, uh, girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of leprosy. He's talking about Elisha. So Naaman told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. Go and visit the prophet, the king of Aram told him, and I will send a letter of introduction to uh, for you to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out uh, and carried gifts, 75 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, 10 sets of clothing. I guess 10 sets of clothing was a big deal back then. The letter to the king of Israel said, with this letter, I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, am I God that I can give life and take it away? Why is this man asking me to heal someone with leprosy? I can see that he's just trying to pick a fight with me. But when Elisha, the, the man of God, heard the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent the message to him, why are you so upset? Send, uh, send Naaman to me, and he will learn that there is a true prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. And when Elisha sent the messenger out to him with his messenger, go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. But Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out and meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call in the name of the Lord God to heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus and Abana and Farpar better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in rage. So one of his officers or servants tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says simply, Go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him, and his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child. And he was healed. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for every person that's in this room and those who are tuning in online. We want to receive your word. Let your living word teach the written word in Jesus' name. And everybody say 
Amen. Um, what I want to do today is I want to talk about the, the essential ingredient, the irreducible minimum, the essential ingredient to a miracle. Naaman was running low on options. He's a man of influence. He has prowess. He has, um, he has a, a resume, all of these things, and yet he's low, running low on answers. Anybody here ever run low on something before? Run low on money? Got an email from the bank, overdraft, okay? Um, run low on gas? Anybody run low on gas? Run out of gas lately? That's a nightmare. Um, run low on toilet paper, the pandemic, right? Instead of spare the air, it was spare the square. We were just trying to... Or how about running low on chips? You have chips and salsa, right? And, and the salsa is just, just, yell, just crying out, eat me. And, and, and the chips are now crumbs, and you're just using crumbs to sop up the salsa. Anybody ever done it before? Am I the only one? And then you just pour the chip crumbs into the salsa, and you make a soup. Anyways, moving on. Uh, running out of milk. Have dry cereal. That's the worst. Uh, running out of toothpaste, and you got to use your kid's toothpaste, and it's, it's bubblegum flavored, and it's got stuff spilling everywhere, and it's hard and crusted, and it's got a membrane around it. Or how about the, the, how about the fair tickets? You go to the Sonoma County Fair, anybody dare to do that lately? And you, you go, and they sell you tickets in, in, in tens and twenties, but all the rides are in sevens and nines, and, and so they figured it out, right, how to, how to get you there, and and how you always have, oh, I'll have one. i got to use it. Not enough. Never. We're running low. But long story short, Naaman has, has run low on options. He's a man of options. He's, he's a man who has access, yet he's running low on options. He, he's what you would call a success. He's a commander. He has favor with kings, influence, and riches. And despite his education, he's a leper. Despite his success, he has leprosy. Despite his accolades and awards, he has this disease that is spreading and eating him literally alive in his flesh. Despite his notoriety, he can do nothing about it. Um, I heard this the other day. The Air Force, the School of Survival, they talked about the rule of threes. You've probably heard this. You can go, you got to know this. You got if, if you're in a, in a situation, you can go three weeks without food. You can go three days without water. You can go three minutes without air. But they say you can't go three seconds without hope. And before you do anything emotionally or mentally, you've got to get your toughness together to be able to, to overcome. And Naaman is, is losing hope. And so I just want to give you four simple points to this story. And the first point is this, that self-sufficiency is an illusion. I'm going to say it again. Self-sufficiency is an illusion. Something will always come along and destroy your illusion that you are self-sufficient. Naaman is strong, successful, he's a commander, but this is the day of his realization. And all of us will have the day when we think we've oriented our life and we've designed our life in a way that's incubated us from problems and situations until you get the phone call until you get the diagnosis, until that thing happens, and now you realize I'm a self-made man, but I can't make this happen. I can't make this work. This is the day of a reckoning. We all try to uh, design our lives in a way where we got this. We are the ones in control, and yet there's always the, but he had, dot, 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 or the, then one day it all changed, dot, dot, dot. No matter what you're able to put together, at some point, something is going to come along to ruin it. Why? Because there is nothing that wakes us up from the metaphysical illusion and dream of self-sufficiency than when we come face to face with a thing that we cannot move. He cannot use his money or his power to change his situation. But this goes back to a theological idea that's important. There is nothing that is made... Nothing, including you and I, that doesn't need something else to exist. The only one who is self-sufficient to exist and thrive on his own is the living God. Can I get an amen? So we look at Genesis chapter 1 and we see the six days of creation. We see that God made things. And every time he made something, he would make something the next day that could have not survived without what was made the prior day. He didn't make cows and then go, you know what? I should have made grass. This is a bad idea. He made the grass before he made the cows. He made the water before he made the fish. 
Because what God does is he creates the, the sufficiency is there before the thing that will need that thing comes into existence. And so we're always connected to something that we need, okay? We're create, we, there's something that we need. So physiologically, metaphysically, we need things in the natural. But then the Bible says, and there's this interesting statement by Jesus in the New Testament. He said, and the sequential is, is that, that everything prior to the fourth day was made for the fourth day, and the things on the fifth day were made for, uh, made and, and uh, the things before were sufficient for the fifth day, and the things like man was made, okay, for those things, but, but man was made for the seventh day. And this is what Jesus said. He goes, no, man was not made for the seventh day. The seventh day rest was made for man. He said, because you're going to look one way, all the natural things I made, but then I've also created a spiritual arena by which you can pull from my rest to find rest for your soul. Because you will never be sufficient in and of yourself, for yourself, to be able to do it on your own forever. It's impossible. So 2 Corinthians 3 and 5 says this, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything that's coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. Would you say that with me? My sufficiency is from God. One more time. My sufficiency is from God. I heard a story um, about a a man uh, 200 years ago, 1835. He went to the doctor. He was in Florence, Italy, lived in Florence, Italy. He went to the doctor. He, the, you know, in this day, there was, there was uh, famine and there was all kind of anxieties and wars all over uh, this, this area, this peninsula that wasn't Italy at the time, but um, is Florence, Italy now. And there was disease and heartbreak and all those things, and he was suffering with anxiety. And so he goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, hey, look, I can't find anything wrong with you. He said, what you need is a good day. What you need is a laugh. You need to go enjoy life. He said, what, what I would suggest is you go to the, there's a circus in town, and the greatest clown of all time is there. He makes everyone laugh. He makes everyone smile. Go to the circus and enjoy him. His na- the, the clown's name is Romaldi. True story. And this is what the man said. He said, sir, Romaldi cannot help me. And the doctor said, why not? He said, sir, I'm Romaldi. At some point, your own sufficiency ends. Those who are supposed to help us are sick themselves. Money cannot help us. Finances cannot help us. When there is despair, we realize we cannot help ourselves and the things that we have cannot help us. 2 Corinthians 9 and 8 says this, And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Isn't that a great scripture? Because he is our sufficiency. The second thing, the second point today is this. Being offended is easy. I want you to think about a guy who's this powerful, who gets offended. He says, all you gotta do is dip, dip seven times. And the man is irate. Why don't we do something awesome? Isn't there awesomeness that we could do? Isn't there some kind of waving of the hand? Are, are you gonna, think about this. It was a slave girl who told him about Elijah. It was a servant of Elisha who goes out. Not even Elisha comes out and tells him. And then it's his servants and his, the people that work for him who are like, hey, dude, look, if he told you to go do something awesome, wouldn't you do it? Why don't you just go? And it's an offended heart that keeps us from receiving what God has for us. I'm going to tell you, the real issue is in the heart. Because we all have a propensity to get angry and to get offended with God. Now, you may not not think so, but I'm telling you, read the Bible enough, and it's going to hit some areas in your life, and you're going to realize, I'm not in charge, and He is. I don't like this. This doesn't feel good. And you have an opportunity to be offended or to receive. And that's what the Bible says, come humbly to the Word of God to receive it. We have to humble ourselves because an offended heart will thwart what God has for us. These things, to name him, were humiliating. The king is ripping his clothes. Servants and and people, I don't even know who they are, are telling me what to do. The way of salvation of God is not through the great and the proud. It comes through the humble because God is attracted to humility. Can I get an amen? amen? Timothy Keller said this, Pride is the carbon monoxide of sin. It slowly kills you without you even knowing. The basic ingredients of an offense is pain mixed with pride. Pain mixed with pride. So as Christians, here's what we've got to do. We've got to get our pain tolerance up. We've got to get our our offended tolerance up. We've got to say, what what does it take to get you offended? What does it take to get you to quit? Because that's what the devil's going to come after. He knows your number. He knows knows the pressure. He knows the dial. He knows how to get you in the situation where you're like, okay, I'm done. 
I'm done with these people. And what you do is you thwart God's best for your life because you would misinterpret a moment that God was trying to reposition you and do something inside of you and bless your life. Can I get an amen? Amen. So important. So we look at this scripture and we say, hey, he's unflexible. One of my favorite planes to ride on, I've flown on it several times, the 787, the Dreamliner, Boeing Dreamliner. It's unbelievable. And what, there's so many reasons it's, it's amazing and efficient and the air quality inside the, the plane is cool, but it, it's, it's super safe. And one of the things that they did is this, this new um, metal that's in the wings. Basically, these wings, you can pull them up and, and touch. And what they'll do is they'll take, they'll take what the worst turbulence is, whatever that number is, that, that pressure, and they'll, have, they'll, they'll go 150% worse, the, higher than the worst turbulence that's ever been in the sky in aviation. And they'll take that pressure and they'll put the plane under a stress test to make sure it doesn't buckle under stress. It's temper to be able to go, to bend, to be flexible. Here's a scripture, but it's not in the Bible. It's it's in the book of Chad. Blessed are the unoffendable. They shall not be bent out of shape. How do you like that? (laughs) Blessed are the unoffendable. They shall not be bent out of shape. It's hard to carry the presence of God and carry an offense. There are people who departed from Jesus' ministry because they became offended by his word. When was the last time your heart and the word of God came clashing together? That's a good moment. That's a revelation moment. That's a moment that every one of us are going to have when you read the scripture. You can't omit. You can't skip over scriptures and skip over books that you don't like. I need all of God's word. I need to humble myself to God's word. I need this offended heart to be broken up so it can receive God's word because the life is going to come through the word. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And Naaman gets a word from God and he rejects it because he gets offended. You ever been there before? You ever been offended before? Do you know anybody who's ever been offended before? Don't look around. Don't point. We've all been there. We've all felt it. We've all felt frustrated situations in life. There's people today, maybe you're nursing a grudge against God. This didn't work out, and these people, the church didn't, and this happened, and this happened, and all of a sudden, we start, we start getting offended. A, a, a wall of offense begins to get built up. Proverbs 18 and 19 says this, a brother offended is harder to be one than a strong city. Why? Because you build walls. It's harder to be one than uh, the bar, or, or the, the contentions are like the bars of a citadel. Jesus had people following him in John chapter 6. He preaches the word. He's, his, man, his flesh is the manna from heaven. They can't fathom it. And the Bible says they leave because they're offended. Will you leave too? Many could not stay because they were offended. And so we gotta, we gotta deal with that. We gotta deal with offense because when God gives you a word, the question is what do you do with that word? Number three, third point, don't put God in your box. Don't put God in your box. He's not going to do it your way. It, what's interesting is the men that served Naaman know Naaman very well. And this is what they said. If, if Elisha would have asked you to do something awesome, bodacious, cool, you would have done it. You would have been like, okay, this makes sense. Take the ring to Mount Doom. We're in. Go steal the broom from the wicked witch of the West. Sounds like a fun journey. Where do we start? The yellow brick road? Let's do it. Well, what, but, but to dip seven times in the dirty river Jordan? And so what we do is we, we put God in a box and say, it has to be done this way. And what God is really good at is knowing your box and doing the exact opposite of what you would think would be the path of travel to get to the miracle, to get to what God has. Can I get an amen? amen. Here, here's the deal. He, he realizes that a priest, a prostitute, a weakling, a warrior, anybody could do this. He was insulted. He had a mindset of how it should be and how it should look, right? You ever watched a movie trailer and you knew the entire movie before the movie trailer was over? Don't, Groundhog Day, one of my favorite, I think Groundhog Day is one of the great movies of all time because it's the, this overarching movie of this worst guy, the, the hero's journey to becoming genuinely a great guy. But if you watch the trailer of Groundhog's Day, you know the whole movie. Castaway, great movie. Man on an island, really bad. Get saved. It's all in the trailer. You know the whole movie in the trailer. And here's what we assume about God, that we know all about God from the trailer. The Bible is the trailer. We, we, we barely know. The Bible says that eye has not seen nor ear heard nor has it entered the hearts of man all the things that God has planned and he's 
provided and he's put together for those who love him, not just in heaven but in this earth. We think, oh, with streets of gold, I read about that, and, and pearly gates, that's going to be awesome. How fun. Can't wait to skip down. What are we going to be doing? I, I guess we're going like, to be playing the gates, you know, spinning pearls. That's going to be so cool. You can't even comprehend the levels and the dimensions of bliss and what we're going to experience. And don't put God in a box, not in that life nor in this life. Amen? We've got to, we've got to tear the roof off. There, there's, there's this idea that we know best. Sometimes we're coaching God. You ever felt like you were doing that? I, I've done it before. I'm like, okay, God, here's what we got. Here's what we're going to do. And then God's like, yeah, that's not how this is going to go. In fact, it's going to go the exact opposite. You think that the best path of travel is the straight line. So from here to the miracle is a straight line. And God goes, no, actually, it's going to be zigzag. And then right here, you're going to get real disappointed. Right here, you're going to be, have the opportunity to be offended. Right here, the eject button. You can put your thumb on the eject button. But if you will hold out, and the Bible says, if you do the will of God in due time, you shall reap if you faint not. Turn to your neighbor and say, do not faint. Do not give up. Come on, say it with me. Do not faint. Do not give up. Now, here's point number four, and this is really important. This is big. you got to get this. This is the whole sermon. This is the essential ingredient. It's one word. Now, I don't know about you. How many here, how many here like me grew up on the streets? Sesame Street. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. How many grew up on Sesame Street? How many grew up playing on the streets? Playing, playing ball, right? And what was the word? There was one word that you could say that would be like Moses parting the sea. There's one word, car, car. You know, we'd be playing ball, playing football, car, and everyone, we don't even ask. We just, <laughs> and you don't have to say anything. You just come back and you start right where you picked up. Just one word, car. There's another word, dinner. Dinner was a great one. Dinner. My mom, okay. Where are you going, Chad? We're not done. I don't care. Anyways, that's working through that. But there's a word in the Bible that you're going to see all through the scriptures. It is the, it is the irreducible, most irreducible thing to a miracle. If you were to say, what is, what is the irreducible number? What's the irreducible thing that makes a miracle possible? It's this word, obedience. It's that simple. It's obedience. God's people, we, live on promises, not explanations. Amen? Would you wrap your heart around that statement? God's people, we, we live on promises, not explanations. God doesn't explain stuff to us. He doesn't explain, oh yeah, there's this, there's this magic thing in the water, the river and the Jordan, and, and there's this thing. that We want all the explanations. God says to Abraham, follow me, leave your home. Okay, where are we going? Not telling you. What are we doing? Not telling you. What's going to happen? Not telling you. What should, I par- what, should I, what should I pack? Should I bring swim trunks or a parka? Not telling you. He's got like 50 bags. Don't know. Don't know what we're doing. Low information, high action. Low information, but obedient. And he says, you're a friend of mine. I don't have to explain it all. See, when you don't know why, you submit and apply. This is the principle of principle. When we don't know why, we submit and apply. It, 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 but there's a, there's a thing in our heart where obedience is that, is that word. You know, nobody puts baby in a corner. Nobody tells Chatty what to do. I'm my own man. Not going to tell me. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said this, one act of obedience is better than listening to 100 sermons. Mark Batterson, one of my favorite quotes, the key to spiritual growth is your willingness to go out of your way for God. You will find God in uncomfortable places, in inconvenient times. But if you go out of your way for God, God will go out of his way for you. Amen? If you don't leave your comfort zone, nothing will change. If you don't leave your comfort zone, nothing will change. Let me tell you a real simple principle. Are you ready? If you want something clean, you go, like you want your clothes clean, you go to the dry cleaners, right? I'm going to take my clothes to the dry cleaners. Or if you want your car clean, you go to uh, the car wash. If you want your nails clean, uh, you go to the nail salon. Now, I know that's not really why you go to the nail salon, but just I know they clean them before they polish them, okay? I know this. But let's say you, you, you go in, you're like, I want, I want this clean. Okay, here's the key, the, key, the, the key to it is this. The reason that you come out different, the reason it comes out clean is because when you went in, 
you did what they said. Period, right? You go in and you like, do your thing. Do your thing. Yes, I know I bite my nails. Do your thing. Send your car through the car wash. How many loves a good car wash? Splash right here. Put that baby in neutral. You got about 45 seconds of just bliss. All the colors and the splashing, the car's clean. It's awesome. Okay? Come out, right? Why? Because we surrendered to the process. Simple. Obedience is the irreducible minimum of a miracle. Isaiah 1 and 19 says this, If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. On the other side of obedience is blessing. On the others, so one of the key factors, back to the basis, if we're going to walk in spiritual victory, we've got to learn to be obedient. Everybody say obedient. Obedient. We can be a success in the world, but a disaster in heaven. What makes a person a success in heaven? What gives people spiritual authority and clout and grace and favor? It's one simple word, obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is the principal thing. It goes against our human nature because we want to know. We want to understand. We don't want the risk. We want it all planned out. No matter what is ruining your soul, getting it down, no matter the size of your problem, no matter how bad you think you've ruined your life, can I tell you, there is one cure for it all, and it's the God of Israel. And when we obey, there's breakthrough. Can I get an amen? amen. And what I love, and I'm going to end with this, 2 Kings 5 and 15, Naaman said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Now I know. On the other side of obedience, you're going to know. On the other side of obedience, we're going to fully understand. On the other side of obedience, it's all going to make sense. It's on the other side of obedience. Amen? Amen. Now, with that said, with that said, I wanna, I'm going to give you really quickly uh, kind of a, just kind of tell you about a miracle. Um, my wife and I, our story of how we got to Santa Rosa is a miracle. We, you know, 20 two-year-old kids getting married, which is very young, and uh, she begged me to marry her. I said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> We're a little young, but just be patient with me. And she's, she said last year, she finally raised me. I'm the man that she dreamed, and so it only took 19 years. It's amazing. And uh, man, right away, we got in a car. Like, we, we got back from the honeymoon, jumped in, in, in her car. I didn't have a car. I jumped in her car, and I gave my car away, didn't, so we got in her car and just started driving. We drove and we ministered and helped churches. And for three years, we, we literally traveled around the United States and didn't know what God had. And so one day, uh, God did something in our hearts. It was like, we're done with this. We, we don't want to do this anymore. And we don't know what it is that God has for us. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what we're doing. We just know that God is shifting something. And so we said, we're going to just settle down. We're going to go. We've been asked to help several times with my father-in-law's church. There's a daughter work down in Morgan Hill. So we'll go down there and we'll be praying, we'll be praying, we'll be praying. Well, um, in January of 2005, I went with a bunch of friends and we would go in January at the beginning of the year, we'd always go to Louisiana, to Menden, Louisiana. And a bunch of us would go and we would pray and fast for a week. It was perfect because um, just down the street from Menden, Louisiana was the crawfish hole. And so at the end of our fast... We would eat crawfish, and it was so good for our system to remember this world is not your home, okay? Um, it was, um, but we would go and we would pray, and we would, we would seek God for the year with a bunch of ministers. Most, most of us are all pastors now all over the United States, all over the world. And long story short, um, it was in that prayer meeting that God gave me this vision. At this time, I'm working in Morgan Hill, and, and, and I see like this, this, this hand and it reaches up above the Bay Area like, like a man's head, like oil being poured, but the, the head is like the North Bay, and it's pouring over the Bay Area. So I'm like, okay, God's going to bring do something in Morgan Hill. It's gonna, I'm sorry, in the Bay Area, it's going to flow down to Morgan Hill. Okay, okay. I had no idea that a week later, uh, Ron Sharp, who was leading a group of, of wonderful people um, at a church that was not called the Promise Center, um, would ask me to come and speak. And this is the church that my, my wife's grandma was you know, attending and, and a part of. And so 
Long story short, we go and we preach, and, and on our way home, we're like, you know, my, I'm just like, my throat, my allergies are going bonkers. It's spring in Sonoma County, and I'm like, I am so glad we do not live in Santa Rosa. And, and, and then I said those words, and the phone rings, and Ron Sharp, Jeremy's dad, says, hey, I would love for you to take this church. I really feel like God. And so we're like, thank you so much. And long story short, through prayer and confirmations and da da da, da all of a sudden we realize God's calling us. And we didn't know. We didn't know it's expensive here. We didn't know, um, you know, 93% of people are unchurched in Sonoma County. We, we didn't know that the 101 would never be finished. We, we didn't think about those things. All we had, all we had was a calling. That's it. We just had a calling here. Like God planted us here. We had, a, we had a church that was living inside of us. God began to give us visions and prophecies and things that God was, we'd write them down. It seemed like insane, like what God was going to do. And, and, and there was 29 people, 29 people that voted us, uh, voted us in. 28 yeses, one no. And we're still looking for whoever that no was, okay? <laughs> They've not told us. But we, 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 we came and, and then uh, soon after we, we, we established the Promise Center and we took all these steps and we had this space on Lum, uh, Lombardi Court and many of you were there. Remember when we had four services in Lombardi Court and people were like lying. How many remember li- like the line like to Lum- into Lombardi Court and people would be standing in line because we had services back to back to back to back. And it was just, it was about people and it was about promises. It was about the presence of God and, and it, and it, we just knew God was in it. We just knew, and we, we knew that there was things in our heart that, that he was doing, and he was preparing us, and we took all these steps. We took these steps of, of leaving our denomination because we knew there was more than the, the construct of where we came from, and we knew that, that this grace was moving, and God had a church that was taking territory, and, and, and kingdom was moving, and all these things that were in us, and we didn't know how to verbalize it. We didn't know how to understand it. The church that we see today, we saw it. We saw it. It's like, like Di- Walt Disney's wife, you know, when she comes into Disney World for the first time, and, and, and her friend says to, to Walt Disney's wife, he says, he says, I wish Walt could be here to see it, and she says, he did see it. That's why it's here. He saw it, and, and we saw, and, and, and there were things that we, we, we saw that we still haven't seen today, and and all of this was living inside of us. And so we just took all these steps. God opened the door in 2005 and uh, 2015, 16 for this building. And we took this great leap of faith to, to come and buy this building. And it was a miracle. And it was, people said, I never forget, we walked a bunch of people through and even friends that were pastors, they go, this, would, this, this office building could never be a church. And we were like, no, we have that knowing. We know it can be. We know it will be. We just know. And like, well, that's the most important. If you know, you know. And then some people are like, yeah, we, yeah. but we, we knew that God was in it and over and over and over. And so long story short is a couple years ago, I got the part point email. And the email has a bunch of people who own buildings all around here. And they, they um, had their names and their phone numbers and their emails. And I'm like, hmm interesting. Let me make a phone call. And so I called the gentleman. I said, hey, I know you own some buildings, and yeah, I just want to chat with you. I'm pastor of the Promise Center, yada, yada, yada. And he said, hey, we've got that building, this building, and down the street. Building. Okay, cool. Are you interested in selling any of these buildings that are on, on the park point? And he said, absolutely not. It was like, close the door, like, hey, man, you're asking a dumb question. I'll, I got a, a barn, I'll sell you, that's in, you know, up in the hills, and da, da, I'm like, whoa, man, this is okay. And then about two months before the pandemic, I did these prayer walks around our, our property. And again, if you're praying outside in Santa Rosa and talking to yourself, it's not a big deal. Everyone does it. <laughs> and so I'm out there just talking and walking and praying and not a big deal and just normal. And, and man, that feeling, that knowing, that same knowing of, come to Santa Rosa, that same knowing about this building, the same knowing about what we were doing at Lombardi Court and these steps. It was like, something is about to change. Okay, I don't know what that means because it's never a straight line. It's always zigzag. And so we thought, well, maybe this, this building behind us, the one next to Concentra, you know, that building that he owns, this will happen and we'll be able to put kids over there. It'll be so fun and this is going to be cool. And, and so nothing happens. Nothing happens. Nothing comes about and we're just kind of, 
sitting in this and like, okay, I don't know, but I just know something, but I don't know what that is. And so I go to the father's house, a meeting with a bunch of pastors last year. And while I'm there, pastor walks up to uh, Heidi and I and says, hey, there's a building. I see a deed. I see it being written. I see something. Okay. I'm, my antenna's like, dit, 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 dit. I don't know. I can't make this happen. I don't have the strength to do it. I'm giving you the very short abbreviated version of this story. Two months ago, the gentleman that I called was like, nope, not selling you anything. And if I did, it would be at a high price. Calls and says, hey, I want to sell you this building. So let me show you the building. 1211 North Dutton is the building that we're currently in, 18,000 square feet, which we're keeping. 1235 North Dutton is the building that has been offered to us. Now, here, here's what I want to tell you. The first thing I thought was, oh, he's going to want a deal. He's going to want to sell and just get as much from the church as possible. So I'm thinking it's going to be X amount. And we'll talk about that. If you have questions, we'll, I'll tell you about how to ask those questions later. But he gives the number, and we're blown away because it's, about half to a third of what it would first cost to build that building. It, it's half of what I thought he was going to ask. And we're like, hurry, let's pray. Talk to our overseers. <laughs> Talk to the board of trustees before this man changes his mind. <laughs> we don't know what's happening. All we know is that this has to be a God thing. Yeah. And so long story short, it's presented to us and says, Hey, um, make it happen, but we've got to hap- it's got to happen by this date, which is December 4th. December 4th is, is, the, is the miracle date. It's 12 weeks from today. We, we need a miracle. We're going to mi- we're gonna have miracles in this, in this church uh, by that date. It's going to be the 12-week miracle. Would you just say that with me? 12-week miracle. I, I, I want you just to say it because I've, I've said it a lot, and I've said it to God a lot. And yesterday, got, finally got the kids and family out of the house and got on the ground because it's kind of weird when the kids walk in and you're on the ground crying and talking to God. And, <laughs> and so talking to God, 12-week miracle. We have 12 weeks. Now, here's the beautiful thing, and, 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 and you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna filter this through however you're going to filter this. But our go-forward number to close, okay, and, and, and I know that... You know, there are numbers out there that could be 10 million, 50 million, a trillion dollars, but this is our number, and we're going to do it. This is our number. Our number is 585,000 gets us into that building. We own that building. That's it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. Now, before we, before, let, let, me, let me say this. Here's what's beautiful is there are people renting and they're amazing tenants and they help cash flow. And what's really cool and what's really amazing too is that there's 7,000 square feet that's immediately available. So next steps, training center, media, audit, media center for filming, um, and, and uh, classrooms for small groups, multiple classrooms, places to go for people to have groups and classes on Wednesday where you have you know, FPU and freedoms and all this, all these things going on at the same time. And then what's even cooler, and here's what's fun, is that by m- removing the next steps from that south end of the building, we can expand our kids' zone and take it to the next level. Like something amazing for impact and kids and next generation and so on and so forth. So our go forward number is $585,000, but here's what I'm going to say. Here's our faith number. Our faith number is a million dollars. Our faith number is a million dollars. This allows us to do incredible things, to go to the next level, to prepare all these spaces because this space is not about a a person. It's about people who come in. It's about promises that have been said, and it's about the presence of God. And we're creating more space for those moments where lives are changed. I talked to Jerry Lanford, one of my favorite buds who, who's serving on the dream team today. Maybe he's in this service. I don't know. But we were talking just a few weeks ago. Before he knew anything, he said, Pastor, I just want to tell you, you know, when we poured this concrete, the concrete that you're stand, sitting on right now that, that's at your feet, it's brand new. We had to dig this down and put this concrete down. So if you're wondering why it gets a little chilly down there, you're in a bowl, okay? 
We're trying to, we're working on it every single day. We got a great team that's working on it. But long story short, um, in this concrete are scriptures. In this concrete are, are proclamations. In this concrete are things that were written. He says, hey, names that I put in there, slowly they've been coming and getting baptized and getting saved and coming to the Promise Center. Like this is not about a campaign to raise money. This is a campaign to step into miracles, to see breakthrough, because every season that we've gotten this nudge, we've gotten this, this thing from God, this instruction, every single time, and I, I promise you, this happens with every church, the breakthrough comes in partnering with God because it, it does something to our hearts. It prepares us for what God's gonna do every single time. So this is not a financial journey. This is a spiritual journey that we as the promise center are gonna go on for the next 12 weeks. In fact, here's what I'm gonna tell you. The next three weeks, because some of you are worried about friend day next week. Like, but what if I bring my friend next week? What are you gonna say to them? <laughs> the next three weeks is just prayer. The first three weeks of the 12-week journey is simply prayer. We're gonna have prayer every day. We're going to be sending out a prayer idea and thought for us to lean into and declare and speak. Amen? Amen. Every day. And then Saturday mornings from 8 to 9 o'clock, every Saturday for the next three weeks, okay, we're going, to have, we're going to open this up and you can come. You can pray. And when we get into October, then we're going to have some vision nights and some conversations. You can ask questions and we can show you future blueprints of stuff that can be built over there, an auditorium three, size, three times the size. And there's just so The next strategic move for the Promise Center is in this moment. It's a miracle moment. And you're, for whatever reason, you're a part of it. Well, I just, I, I'm, I just started coming two months ago. For whatever reason, you've been called into this moment. I don't understand it. There are spiritual breakthroughs that happen every time we do this in people's lives. Every time we do this. I want you to hear me out. There was a, a lady named Rahab who was a harlot who lived in Jericho, a wicked city that built walls against the kingdom of God. She says, there's people of promise. I want a part of that. So she assists those. She sows. She becomes a stakeholder with those who are heirs of the promise. I want a part of that. And so she helps out the spies that come in. She helps them down the window, puts, a, puts the scarlet, you know, the, 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 the piece of, Cord, there it is, cord, out the window. All this stuff's going on, and all of a sudden, something happens in this moment, a decision that reorients her life. She gets engrafted into the family. When you read the genealogies of Jesus, she's there. She's like the great, great, great grandma of, of Jesse and David and Jesus. She's not just a part of the clan. She's a part of the promise by saying, I want to be a stakeholder. And so here's what we're asking, and this is what we're saying. Like, I don't know all the things that are going to happen for this miracle to happen, but I do know this, that God is going to speak to you, that God is going to move on your heart, that you may have a dream in the middle of the night and a number, and you're going to turn to your wife and go, okay, I had a crazy dream, and there's a number, and she's going to go, I had the same dream with the same number. You go, that can never happen. It's happened several times. You're going to hear, you may hear from God the day of the offering. You may hear from God today. You may have creative flow come through your mind. You go, I could do this and I could do that. You may say, God, here's the number that's in my heart. You're going to make up the difference. You're going to fill the gap. I can do this, but I want to do this. And God's going to show off in some amazing ways. So this is a spiritual journey for our church, not a financial campaign. If you think of it as a financial campaign, don't worry. I, I don't want that part of your heart but I want the part of your heart that believes that God is big and bodacious and does amazing things to his church. We are in the center of the city. We're in the center of the city, in the center of the county for a reason. Dutton and College, this corner belongs to Jesus. This is kingdom territory. People will be coming here for assistance and direction and breakthrough and freedom and deliverance and the gospel and salvation. We are about impact and people and marriages and things that are unquantifiable. Unquantifiable. And so today I present to you a journey to go on with us. It's just a miracle. It's just a thing that God does at the right time. And you go, well, maybe it doesn't seem like the right time. It's not for me. I'm going to tell you, God's timing is impeccable. So I invite you to open your heart. 
I invite you to come and pray with us. I invite you in the, the month of October to come to some vision nights and ask questions and be a part of, of what God's doing and find the joy in it. On November 6th, we're going to have what is called our Commitment Sunday where we're going to come together and you can bring in your commitment card that we will give you in October. We're not going to do it now. 21 days of prayer. And we will bring those either before or at that date. And on that date, we're going to pray over every commitment card. We're going to declare goodness and grace and breakthrough. And there are things that are going to shift. There are people who are going to step into a level of generosity and grace in your business and in your personal life that's going to open the door for a flow for exponential growth in you and your capacity of what God can put in your hands. It's going to happen. God is raising up millionaires, multi-millionaires to fund kingdom in Sonoma County because the mission is great. And not just for this church. I'm praying blessing over every church. Every church get on on it. I want, the, I want it to flow to every church. When one church wins, when the tide goes up, all the ships rise. It's a blessing, 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 God. 93% unchurched. It's allergies. 101. We, 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 got, we got, but this is a mission field. I remember thinking, I remember when I married Heidi, I said, we're going to be on a mission field. I don't know where. I thought it was going to be Cambodia. I think we're going to be on a mission field. When God called us here, I thought, and he planted us here. He planted our roots deep, and I thought, man, I, America. We're America. We're America. I want to be a missionary. And it didn't take long to realize, wow, this is a mission field. And there are connections to nations through this county and through this Bay Area that God's already set up. There's more to come. So I, I say this. November 6th is our Commitment Sunday. December 4th is our Kingdom Builders Big Offering Miracle Sunday. But the journey, the journey is going to be amazing. And God's going to be with you. God's going to be with us. Amen? I want you to carry joy in your heart for this. I want this to be something that becomes a landmark, a stake where you look back and you go, I remember the day where God was like, dip seven times. And I was like, are you crazy, God? I don't know what it is. I don't know what it's going to look like. But it's a spiritual journey we're going to go on. It's going to be a, it's going to be a blast. And God's going to get all the glory. Amen? Amen. Now, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to ask you two things. Number one, don't mention this to the next service. It's mum's the word. But I'd like for you to stand with me. And I want us to pray. There's these powerful moments in a church's trajectory that matter, that are important. And a church is not a program, it's people. You know, this church is built on some of the most amazing people. I'm so grateful for our overseers, our elders, our board of trustees. I'm thankful for Pastor Dave Patterson and Dan Lord and these other people who speak into our lives. And I'm, I'm thankful for the, the team of people that are here and our staff. And I'm thankful for some of you who have been with us from the beginning. I mean, you, the days where the auditorium wasn't too cold, it was too hot. Sweating profusely. Swamp coolers. Everybody was gathered around the swamp cooler like it was a communion table. We're going to have communion around the swamp cooler, you know? Just these moments that made us, these moments that made this what it is. I want to be like David, born on the, the Jebusite. Just take the threshing for it. It's free. It's yours. No, no, no. It's got to cost me something. It's got to cost me something. Anything worth building, any sacrifice worth having, any, any building that we erect, it's, it's got to come, it's, it always comes with us putting our hearts behind it. So I just want your heart to be a part. We're saying all in. We're just going to be all in. That's, that's the all in, 12-week miracle. All in. 100% would love for you to find your place in the miracle. Would you lift your hands and would you, would you open your heart and close your eyes with me? Hands lifted, hearts open. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I know you've been speaking to Heidi and I. You're already working in us and I don't know. I'm so open, God. I just want to 
I want to see your goodness in the land of the living. I want to see more souls saved and baptisms. Just, I want to see more people come to know you and walk in freedom. There's prayer warriors and missionaries and pastors and leaders and people who are, their worldview is going to be rocked when they come to know you. In this place, this is kingdom territory. Park Point is kingdom territory. It belongs to you. It's holy, sacred ground. We thank you, God, for your goodness. I thank you for every person that's in this room, their heart, their passion, their relationship with you, God. Bless us indeed. Order our steps. Loose the miracles. Loose the miracles. God, help our eyes to see in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. Would you say this with me? All in. Say it with me. All ears. I'm all in. I'm all ears. That's all we ask. We're going all in, all ears. God is good. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you so much. Thank you for being part of our family.